Right, so I just, uh, hello everyone and welcome to this uh, seventh seminar in our machine learning and physics seminar series. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone that this is recorded and we'll publish this talk on the YouTube channel. So today we have the, the pleasure of welcoming Stefan Mala. Stefan is an applied uh, mathematician and professor at the Collège de France on the chair of data sciences. He's a member of the French Academy of Sciences and of the Academy of Technologies and a foreign member of the US National Academy of Engineering. He was a professor at the Courant Institute at New York University for 10 years and also held positions at the Ecole Polytechnique and Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. Uh, among his many achievements, he has uh, co-founded and served as the CEO of a semiconductor startup company and was the recipient of the 27 Blaise Pascal Prize from the French Academy of Sciences. He kindly agrees to give us a talk today on the subject of Hamiltonian estimation by conditional renormalization group and convolution net. Thank you very much for joining us, Stefan, and the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very happy to, to give this seminar because uh, uh, it's indeed a very rich interface between um, machine learning and physics. Myself, I'm coming from uh, applied mathematics, as you mentioned, but I came uh, uh, into physics because of uh, the fact that we were discussing about that, that's the, the problems are often better posed in physics and we are facing these very difficult problems of understanding convolution networks nowadays. So it provides a better framework often to study it. And I'll try to show through this talk that there are very close relations between the tools that have been developed in physics and uh, the type of algorithm and mathematics which are behind. So, uh, the problems uh, I'll be looking at is the general problems essentially ambitious of learning physics from data and priors. And the typical difficult problems are uh, the problems which involves the uh, interaction of many bodies with a fluctuation on the many lengths of scales. So you have this uh, uh, toy models that is called 5.4 that I'll be mentioning about, but uh, the applications we're really interested will be more in cosmology. I'll be speaking a bit about weak lensing, uh, distribution of matter uh, in the cosmos, but also turbulence flow, whether it's fluid turbulence as here or gas turbulence uh, in astrophysics. And at the infinitely small or very small scale at quantum chemistry uh, problems. So I'll be looking at problems uh, from the statistical physics uh, angle, uh, problems at equilibrium. And here the issue is to try to learn the Hamiltonian. In other words, the energy that defines the probability distribution of the states. And in this machine learning framework, what we have are realizations or so examples of state out of which we'd like to estimate uh, this energy. So basically, uh, the, the questions that immediately arise are modeling questions. So what's the family of energies which are reasonable to capture the physics we are interested in? And as always in that type of problem, there is the optimization problems that comes in to optimize potentially the parameters that are there. One thing that I'll be showing are relations with image classifications, which looks extremely different, but nowadays we know neural nets are behind both. So there should be something that is similar behind it. So if we look at uh, the physics problem, obviously there has been a huge amount of work on that. And the simplest problem that have been studied for uh, large uh, scale interactions are Gaussian models. So Gaussian model means that the energy has a quadratic form like this, where K here is the inverse of the covariance. And in particular uh, for turbulence, that was a model that was proposed by the famous Kolmogorov 1941 paper, where he derived from Navier-Stokes equations, the fact that under a Gaussian hypothesis, you will get a power spectrum which has a four to the four third decay. And here what you see are images at the top, the original image at the bottom, the Gaussian model, which have exactly the same power spectrum. And as you can see, obviously, is that we are losing a lot of structures. It gives information about regularity, but nothing about essentially the geometry of the structures. So the question is how to capture this information 
Of course, people tried to go towards higher order moments, and that was essentially a failure because there's too many high order moments, and statistically, uh, the estimators have a very large variance. Now, here came the deep neural network. So uh, neural networks, uh, as I imagine most of you know, have been mostly used, uh, but not only for classification and regression. So in this case, you want to estimate a parameter y that may be, for example, an energy or the class of an image, given the data x. And typically, to do so, you would like to estimate the probability of y given x. And the base classifier would consist in taking the y, which maximizes this probability. So essentially, you can view a neural network as an estimator, a parameterized estimator, of this probability distribution. And what is the parameters? Well, when you build your network, you are choosing linear operators, which are convolution operators that have, in the case of images, a very small support, translation invariant, it's a convolution, and then followed by a rectifier. You have all these images, which corresponds to different filters. And then the next layer, you recombine all these images with the filters, which is still convolutional to build the other image of the next layer with a subsampling every few layers. And again, you apply your uh, rectifier, you cascade, and you'll get very small images up to the final linear classifier, or sorry, the final linear operator that is going to build the model of your log probability. So the parameter theta here of your probability is the aggregation of all these matrices which may correspond to hundreds of millions or billions of parameters. Now, how do you optimize these parameters? Basically with a gradient descent, which simply is maximizing the likelihood. In other words, you are trying to find the parameter theta, which maximizes the probability to observe y given x for all the database that you have. And the big surprise, as you know, is that that kind of architecture gives exceptional results, not only for classifying images or sounds, but also for language, but also for regression in physics and to generate physical fields. So the question is to try to understand what are the relation between these networks and their architecture and the underlying physics, given the fact that they can simulate some interesting physical phenomena. So when you look at them, there is one thing that immediately is striking is that you have a kind of multi-scale approach because progressively you have filters that as you do the subsampling uh, across layers are going to have what is called a receptive field. In other words, a support, which is getting broader, broader and broader. In other words, you are progressively aggregating the information as you go towards fine scale. The other thing is that the first layers are relatively simple. People have observed something like small localized wave that we'll call wavelets, and we'll see that afterwards. So people tried that to model, as you probably know, physical fields, such as the turbulent fields that I showed. And that's in particular the work of Matthias Bedge and their team, where basically they train a network on something totally different, uh, dogs, cats, and cars, and so on. And then they take one such field, they decompose their field over their network, and then they compute the correlation matrix at any given uh, uh, depths between two images within uh, this uh, layer. And how do they restore an image? They try to synthesize an image which produces the same correlation matrices inside the networks. And they do that by gradient descent. So the surprising thing is that by doing so, you can synthesize things that look very much alike the original. On the other hand, the number of correlation parameters that they use is huge compared to the number of pixels. So there are here issues of estimations. And one question is basically to try to understand mathematically what is all this about. So what I'm going to try to do is 
to show the relations with a concept which is very important in physics, which is the renormalization. So this is an old idea. Many people have been emphasizing the relation between the two because of these ideas of scale. What I'm going to show here is that not only there is a similarity with uh, Wilson renormalization, if you look at them within these wavelet bases, but it gives a different outlook at the renormalization group. And that's what I'll call here a conditional renormalization group, which is a bit different from the standard physical one or the one used by Wilson, which may be one reason why you can get these results that were not previously obtained. The second thing will be to try to understand what kind of potentials we can use to build these models. And the key elements I'll try to emphasize is the fact that what you need to do is to capture the interaction between scales. And to capture interaction between scale, you need to be nonlinear and phase, and in particular separating phase from amplitude is going to play a very important role. And we'll see how this will lead to turbulence models. And the third part, I'll show the relation between regression and classification problem in deep network. One application will again be for physics to, to do energy regression in quantum chemistry, but I also look at standard image classification problems because it's very interesting to see the correspondence between the two. So let me first begin with the renormalization group, and I'll begin with a standard view as it was introduced by Kadanoff and Wilson in the 70s. So the idea here is you have a field. So X, I'll be using the notation of machine learning. X is my field, it's not phi, okay? So X zero is the field at the very fine scale. And in this framework, we suppose that we do know the Hamiltonian. In other words, we do know the energy. And the idea is to try to reduce the number of degrees of freedoms. And to do that, you progressively build a coarser and coarser approximation of your field with averaging and subsampling. So once you reduce the size of your field, the idea is to try to compute what is the probability distribution of this field at a larger scale. And that's going to define a new energy functions. And of course, you can compute this probability distribution from fine scale to a coarse scale by doing marginal integrations. So the key idea of this renormalization group is to observe that you can parameterize these energies. These will be in physics, the coupling constants that define the interaction within the fields. And because one field can be derived from the uh, finer scale field, you are going to build a map from this coupling constant at the coarse scale to the coupling constant uh, from the fine scale to the coarse scale, excuse me. So basically when you move across scale, you are going to see an evolution of these coupling constant. And the key observation of Wilson is that phase transitions corresponds to a fixed point of these maps, which defines the evolution of the coupling constants, essentially of the physics across scale. Okay, so this is the view very briefly of the renormalization group. And typical applications that have been used is for scalar potential. The scalar potential are the cases where the energy doesn't only have a quadratic term as a Gaussian uh, distribution, but you also have a nonlinear potential, which only depends upon each point of the field. So it imposes value on the scalar value of the field. So you have a potential that you can expand, for example, over a polynomial. And the well-known case of the 5-4 model, the potential is a combination of power four and power, power two, so that you have two minimum near minus one and one, so that the field values have a tendency rather to be equal to either minus one or one. And as you know, if you modify the parameters 
between the quadratic term that is here, the kinetic energy defined by a Laplacian and the potential term. At one point, you, you are going to arrive to a phase transition where you have very long range interactions that comes in. So one observation. In physics, usually you expand these potential in polynomials, but you can as well expand the potential as a piecewise linear approximation. That would mean to expand your potential with ROLU. There is an advantage is that then the potential is not going to dominate the quadratic term at infinity. So stability issues will be much easier if you use rectifiers rather than potential. Okay, now to compute this renormalization group, as we said, the key point is to compute the probability distribution of xj from the probability distribution of xj minus one. To do so, what you need to do is to do a marginal integration over all the free variable of xj minus one, which are not within xj. Now, the question is how to express these free variables. The standard approach is to use uh, Fourier basis. If you come back to the publication of Wilson in the 70s, this is not the first one. Uh, this is not what he used. He used something like wavelets. So what is a wavelet? A wavelet is going to be an orthogonal basis that is going to characterize these three degrees of freedom with waveform, which looks like sine wave, oriented sine wave, but which are local in space. And with these wavelets, if you dilate them by scale to the J and you translate them, you can get an orthogonal basis. What does that mean? It means that if you take your field XJ minus one, you can expand it orthogonally into a coarser field plus the wavelet coefficients. And you see this field is expanded into this one. Here are the wavelet coefficient, which are the high frequency fluctuations that allows you to come back to X zero. Then XJ minus one can be redecomposed, really coarser field, wavelet coefficient, coarser field, wavelet coefficients. Now we have uh, the system of coordinates now to do the integration, and we can therefore compute this probability distribution. Now, here is the twist. Instead of trying to compute, so in, in the situation in which we are, we don't have the Hamiltonian. We need to compute the Hamilton and to define the model. So the way we are going to do it is instead of trying to build a model of the probability distribution of these images, we are going to try to compute a co model of the conditional probability of the probability of xj minus one given xj. Now, if you have decomposed your image into a wavelet basis to know xj minus one given xj, it's the same thing than to know the high frequencies given the low frequencies. So in other words, to learn the interactions between the high frequencies and the low frequencies. And that will be the model that we're going to build. Now, once you have that, you can build a model of the fine scale grid because it basically consists in taking the model of the coarse grid, then building a model of the wavelet coefficient reconstructs the next grid building a model of the next wavelet coefficient, the next grid, and so on. And you get an expansion of your probability distribution as a product of these refinement conditional probability distribution. So now the key problem is build a model of these conditional probability distribution, which again appear indirectly in Wilson calculations, which are these energies which are really the interaction energies between high and low frequencies. So to do so, now you face an optimization problem. And that's where we're going to see why the renormalization is so important and why this factorization is important. Basically, it's going to totally precondition the problem. In general, if you want to find a parameter theta, of a probability distribution, you will do it by minimizing the minus likelihood loss or maximizing the likelihood. 
To do so, you can do a gradient descent. And the gradient descent basically consists in updating the parameter until the expected value of uh, the probability distribution of your model will be the same than the expected value of the true probability distribution on the potential that defines your model. So that's the standard log likelihood. And we know that the rate of convergence is going to depend upon the Haitian, which corresponds to the covariance of the potential that was used for the model. Now, the big problem is that when you are close to a phase transition, this gets very unstable and the iteration almost doesn't converge. It gets extremely slow. Now, if you factorize the problem, instead of computing the parameter of the field, you slice it into these conditional parameters. The first thing that you're going to get is that these instabilities are going to disappear. And the reason why is the following. Basically, you are constructing fields whose probability distribution have a power spectrum that have a power low decay. So the ratio between the smallest to the largest eigenvalues are very large. This is essentially the bad conditioning of your Haitian. When you slice the problem, you are basically with wavelets, you basically isolate different frequency bands. And within each of the frequency bands, the spectrum changes by a constant. So within each frequency band, the problem is well conditioned. And it's this preconditioning that allows you to very quickly compute these conditional parameters. So the first thing that you can do, and that will, I'll begin with this toy model to, to see, to try to understand what's happening, is to recover the 5-4 model. So for the 5-4 model, what you want to recover is the quadratic term that happens to be uh, a Laplacian, but you don't know. So it's a singular operator. And you want to compute the scalar potential. Now, the way we do that is we decompose in a wavelet basis. We compute the conditional probabilities. And then we recascade all these conditional probabilities to recompute the potential. And at each scale, what you see is you are computing a potential. At very coarse scale, the potential looks like a Gaussian potential. And progressively, as you refine it, you are recovering the 5-4 potential. Now, if you are at the critical temperature, at all scales, the potential is going to look alike, exactly because of cell similarity. And you have, with that kind of algorithm, no critical slowing down and a fast convergence, including the estimation of the Laplacians, which is the first quadratic term. OK, now, once you have this, what you can do is sample your field very quickly without suffering from any instability due to the fact that you may be close to the phase transition. How do you do that? You have expanded your probability distribution as a product. And now we are going to synthesize the field by beginning at very coarse scale. Very few pixel, this is going to be fast to simulate. Then with the conditional probability distribution, I'm going to synthesize the wavelet coefficient given the low frequencies, those images. From that, I can automatically reconstruct the finest one. Then I synthesize the wavelet coefficient, reconstruct. Synthesize the wavelet coefficient, reconstruct. Synthesize, reconstruct. Each of these problems is well conditioned because of the renormalization. And you get a very fast sampling whose timing doesn't depend upon the fact that you are at critical scale. So this is just a comparison as a function of the size of the system. If you are close to uh, critical temperature, the number of iteration, it's well known in typical algorithms, grows exponentially. With that kind of conditional uh, renormalization group, it doesn't change. The number of iteration per uh, pixel doesn't change with the size of the system. And when you have to simulate the expected value uh, or the sampling by using an MCMC chain, 
the length of simulation of the MCMC chain doesn't change with the fact that you are close to uh, the critical temperature. The number of iterations is of the order of 30 here once it's preconditioned, as opposed to nearly over 2,000 iterations when you have something which is unstable. Okay, so with that kind of techniques, you can recover 5.4, but obviously this is not our goal. The goal now is going to take this idea and to show in one sense it's related to the deep net and how you can do much more powerful things. So the first application I'm going to look at before deep net is weak lensing. Weak lensing, you have images which corresponds to where you see the light, the light emitted by uh, objects in the, which are very far away. Now, because of the presence of masses, the light is going to be deformed and the deformation of the light, which is called this weak lensing, is going to allow us to infer the presence of uh, dark matter in the universe. So one of the problem is to understand what is the statistics of these images with these, uh, the, uh, these uh, deformation and light fields. And there is now the Euclid mission that is going to be sent by, uh, in particular, a European American consortium. So one of the issues is to understand these statistics. One of the work, and that work was done, all this work was done with Giulio Biroli, Tanguy Marchand, and uh, uh, Mizaki Ozawa was to build a model of these probability distribution, basically by learning the quadratic term and showing that you can model this probability distribution with scalar potential, but at all scale. The fact that you have a scalar potential at all scale means that you can capture not only local interactions, but also global interaction, which is needed when you have a gravitational field. So that's the work that we did. And you can, once you apply this slicing as a product of conditional probability distribution, estimate each of the term, recover the potential, recover the quadratic term, and re-simulate images with an explicit form for the Hamilton. Now, this kind of thing looks a little bit like a very naive network. If you look at a wavelet transform, you have an image, you compute the wavelet coefficient at the first scale, the average, which is really composed, the average, which is really composed with the wavelet coefficient and so on. So it's a first tree and you compute the potential of interactions and that gets you the result for 5.4 or uh, for weak lensing. However, this is not going to be sufficient for turbo. This is not sufficient because the model is essentially based on scalar potential and the interaction between scale remains a little bit too simple. And that's what we're going to look at. So the second part now is going to try to understand how to refine these models by capturing better the scale interactions. Now in our framework, Capturing better the scale interaction means building a model of the conditional probability of the high frequencies given the low frequency. In other words, the wavelet coefficient given the low frequencies, which corresponds to the wavelet coefficient at all larger scales. And so you need to define this interaction energy. In other words, what kind of potential would make sense to capture these interactions? Again, the first idea that comes to mind is to go to high order moments, but that's not possible. Too many moments, too difficult to estimate. It doesn't work. Second approach, what about using a network? Possible. The problem is the black box. We'd like to do physics. So the question is, it, is it possible from the prior we have on physics to infer information about the potential we want to put here? And what I would like to show is that for many physical fields, you can do it. You don't need to go to a blind deep network. So to understand that, I'm going to show images first. This is an image with a lot of geometry. 
This is the average. These are the wavelet coefficients at the first scale. Then you compute that the next scale, next scale. And what you see is the following. First of all, the wavelet coefficients, they are very sparse. That's quite well known because in the regular regions, the fluctuations are nearly zero. And the only place where they are going to be large are near edges, near sharp transitions. But there is something more important. Now, if you look at different scales, whenever you have geometry, the different scales are going to look very much alike. It means that there is a very strong dependency across scale. And it is this very strong dependency that we need to capture. Now, there is one reason why it's not so easy to do it. Because the first way you may think to do is to say, oh, it's dependent. So let's try to correlate the wavelet coefficient at two different scales. The wavelet coefficient essentially consists in taking the image and filter it with a wavelet at a given scale, and another scale filter it with a different wavelet. Now, the problem is that these coefficients are going to be totally uncorrelated. The reason why these coefficients are uncorrelated is because they live in two different frequency bands. And so the phase oscillates at different rates. And if you compute these expected values, it's going to cancel out and the correlation will be zero. So to exhibit the dependency, you need to be nonlinear. And what basically you need to do is to separate the phase from the amplitude. The modulus, the amplitude of the wavelet coefficients are going to be very strongly correlated. But that's not enough. The phase also are correlated. And to show it, what you need is to correlate to see how the phase at one scale correlates with the modulus at the finest scale. And these correlations are going to be non-zero. So basically, the idea is to express the interaction across scale through interactions between amplitudes of these wavelet coefficient and phase. Now, the problem we're going to get is that these correlation matrices now are going to be very large. And if you want to do an estimation, you would like to do something like a PCA or to almost diagonalize your covariance matrix. And that's where we're going to get closer to deep net because how to do that, you can prove that in order to nearly diagonalize this covariance matrix, what you do need to do is to compute a second wavelet transform. In other words, separate the different scales that are within this envelope. And if you do that, you are getting to get much fewer correlation coefficients which are these so-called scattering coefficients. So let me show now how it relates to a, wavelet, to a network. First, we did our wavelet transform, computing the variation at different scale. Then each of these images, we applied the nonlinearity, which is here a modulus. And then we recompute a wavelet transform. And then we renormalize each of the scale exactly as in a normalization group. And finally, we compute the correlations between the wavelet transform of the wavelet transform and all the other coefficient at any given length. So here it begins to look like a bit more like a, a, a neural net, but we don't learn the filters. They are all wavelets. So essentially deep network without learning the weights. Now, if you do that, if you take images of turbulences, if you build a model which is essentially consists in computing the parameters of these potential obtained with calculating the interactions across scale, you resynthesize fields which have essentially the same statistics, which recover the geometry. The number of correlation is much fewer than what you would get in a deep net. Instead of having 10 to the power of five coefficients, we have about a thousand coefficients, which is fewer than the size of the images. And these coefficients are interpretable. We know exactly what it corresponds to, what kind of interactions we are calculating across scales. 
So that's the kind of thing that we've been applying to uh, cosmology. So that's the work that was done in collaboration with physicists at Ecole Normale Supérieure in the Astrophysics Cosmological Group, who is in particular led by Erwan Alice. And this is a distribution of mass in the universe where you see the uh, filament structures. This is the maximum entropy uh, generation with that kind of models that capture these interactions. And here we have an explicit expression of the Hamiltonian. And we've been working on the application of that kind of thing to regress the cosmological parameters, but I won't uh, go so much into that. So I would like to finish by looking at the regression and classification problem to show how all this is related. So in the case of regression and classification, what we want to do is to estimate, let's say, an energy given the state x. And what we're going to use is the same structure. So we are going to compute the scattering transform by computing the wavelet transform and the modulus, and then reapplying a wavelet transform and a modulus that you see here. And the ones that haven't yet gone to the bottom of the network, we are going to average the coefficients. So these are all the coefficients that we're going to get out of this cascade of wavelet transform modulus. So it's again, a kind of very naive network. And the naive thing is to say, so there is no combination across channel. Out of that, let's try to compute the energy. In other words, the log probability. Now, there is one reason also why doing this makes sense. There is one fundamental property that you can prove that you obtain by doing this scale separation is stability to action of diffeomorphism. If X is deformed with a diff diffeomorphism, in other words, imagine an image which is going to be deformed. Tau is a translation which depends upon position, so it's a deformation. There is one very important property. If you look at these coefficients, so in the output of your network, they are stable to deformation. In other words, they almost linearize deformation or they linearize small deformation, which means that the representation of a deformed image compared to the deformation of the image is going to be of the order of the size of the deformation. In other words, it's Lipschitz continues to the deformation. This is a very important property that is not obtained with a Fourier transform. And we'll see that it plays an important role in almost all applications. So let me first begin with quantum chemistry. In quantum chemistry, what you have is the following. You know the position and the charge of the atoms of a molecule. In other words, you know the different type of atoms, carbon, hydrogen, and so on. And what you would like is to learn the uh, ground state energy without going through calculating uh, the n-body Schrodinger equation. Now, there is, of course, a beautiful approach that was introduced by Kahn and Sham to approximate the n-body Schrodinger problem by observing that the energy only depends upon the electronic density and by relating the electronic density to uh, this energy. Now, the electronic density, of course, you don't know it if you don't solve the Schrodinger equation either. In what we're going to do is first use the prior information to structure the network and then learn this energy. So what kind of information do we have in this problem? What we're given is a list of atoms. So obviously, this list uh, gives, as I said, the number of charge and the position, and the energy is invariant to the indexing of the list. First obvious property. Second property, the energy is invariant to translation of the molecule. So translation of all the position parameters. It's invariant also to rotation. If you slightly deform the molecule, the energy is going to change slightly. 
The other thing is that you have fundamentally a multi-scale problem. Why? Because you have very strong covalent bound chemical interaction at very short scale. Long range scale, you have the electromagnetic force in particular van der Waal forces. So what the kind of decomposition that you're going to obtain with a multi-scale representation gives you is a kind of factorization of these forces first evaluating the very strong at high frequency interaction forces, and then regrouping at different scale, the forces responsible to, uh, due to the electromagnetic field. All these properties I'm just stating, by the way, will essentially be the same for images, which explains in particular why the problems are somewhat uh, similar. Now, in the case of quantum chemistry, what you're given is, as I said, the position of the atoms. So we're going to represent this electronic density in a very naive way by saying that each atom has exactly the charge located at its position. So you have a Dirac whose amplitude is multiplied by the number of charge. Then we are going to compute our wavelet transform. But to get an intuition of what's happening, make a convolution of your Dirac's, some of Dirac, with a wavelet. A Dirac convolved with a waveform gives you back the waveform located at the position of the Dirac, multiplied by the amplitude of the Dirac. So what is going to happen is that it's as if each Dirac is emitting a waveform, a small wavelet. These wavelets are going to interact, and then you are going to have the phase collapse, the modulus which is going to produce the interactions. When the wavelets are very small, their support doesn't interact, it just gives you blobs. When the wavelets get bigger, the interactions are going to create these patterns of interference, which are capturing the geometry of the molecule. So you do that on two layers. This is what the scattering network is going to do. Then you average, you are going to get something which is invariant through translation rotation and stable to deformation, and then you do a linear regression. So that was a work that was done by Michael Eichenberg, Giorgio Cacharis, Michael Hearn, Nicolas Poilvert, and Louis Thierry, who were postdoc and student at École Normale Supérieure. Now, if you do that on a large database of 100, that was organic molecules, this is a standard database that was used a few years ago, and you compare that to state-of-the-art deep networks, which learns all the filters, you essentially get the same results. Now, you get the same result in these cases, but these are relatively easy problems. The reason why they are relatively easy is that the molecules that we're using have only of the order of 10 heavy atoms, and at most 30 atoms. So we are dealing with small structures. When you have something simple like that, again, you know enough about the physics and interaction not to have to learn. And if you build the appropriate scale interaction, you will be able to get precise results. Situation gets very different when you have much more complex problems. And that's where I would like to finish. To get these complex problems, I'm going to move to images. So what we are currently doing is we're defining a fixed network that implements this kind of conditional renormalization uh, group approach with wavelets and a linear classifier. If you do that for images on simple image, for example, if you want to classify digits, you will do as well as a deep network which learns everything. The reason is that when you deal with digits, basically the source of variations are translation, rotation, deformations. These are transformation you know about that you've been able to deal with. So everything will be fine. When you have stationary textures, it's like turbulence problem because of stationarity, things will work out and you can do as well as deep nets. If you deal with image, which are much more structured, where you have cats, dogs, mushrooms, and so on, 
there will be a big gap relatively to deep net. If you do this kind of wavelet scattering, the error we get over 1000 class is about 50% error, whereas a ResNet of about a little bit deeper, but not much, will get an error which is four to five times smaller. So the question is, what is learned? And how does it relate to all what we've been discussing about? And that's what I'm going to finish on. This is the work of uh, Florentin Gut and uh, John Zarka, who are uh, finishing their PhD here at Ecole Normale Supérieure. So the idea is the following. Until now, we have imposed the type of interaction models we are putting at each layer. Suppose now that we learn it. So what does it mean to learn an interaction potential? It means that we're going to learn in the language of neural network, a one-one convolution network, an operator that is going to relate all images at different orientation, different frequencies. So when you go to the next scale, you propagate, you learn this interaction operator, which is this one-one operator. However, the spatial filters remain wavelet. So spatially, you still do just a scale separation. The nonlinearity is still a modulus, but you are also going to propagate the phase and you iterate. Each layer, you learn this operator. And once you've done that, you do the linear classifier. So basically you are getting something which is much closer to the standard network. The only difference is that the spatial filters are fixed, they are wavelets. And the only thing that we learn is the filter, which is one, one convolution across the channels. Wavelet filter interactions and so on. It's a neural network where there is no bias parameters. And then you learn everything with a gradient descent. So you learn all these potentials together in order to optimize the classification. So what we saw is that if these operators are identity, so we don't learn them, we just set them independently, you have a much bigger error on ImageNet, about five times more. And even on a smaller database, which is called CIFA, you get an error which is still of the order of four times bigger than uh, a ResNet 80. Now, if you just learn these operators, you reach the state of the art. What that means is that all the information is indeed captured with this, this potential. You don't need to learn the spatial filters. The spatial filters are essentially here to separate scale in order then to create the interaction operators, separate scale, separate scale, and so on. And now, of course, the outstanding problem is to understand what is the mathematical nature of these, poten these uh, interaction potentials that have been learned at each scale. But once you understand that, basically you have a framework where you've learned entirely your uh, energy or your Hamiltonian. And what clearly appears is that each time what you've been learning are these conditional probabilities, which relates one scale to the next scale. So I'll be concluding on that. Basically, my first, what I call important conclusions is that it seems really that these deep network architecture are learning scale interaction. This topic of scale interaction is an old topic in physics. We know uh, that turbulence is about scale interaction, small world creating larger world and a propagation of energy across scales. One can view these architectures as a way to learn these in interaction. The second thing is that the renormalization group framework is, I believe, an appropriate framework to understand what's happening. In particular, it allows to understand why suddenly you are preconditioning the problem. But again, let me insist, there is a basic difference with the more standard way renormalization group is viewed. 
is that when people define what is often called a Hamiltonian ansatz in physics, they define it on the field itself, on the microscopic uh, Hamiltonian or on the Hamiltonian at or the energy at the different scale. That's not what we do. Basically, we say this is much too complicated. What we are modeling is the conditional probabilities. In other words, the interaction Hamiltonian between the high frequencies and the lower frequencies. Now, the important thing is that because this problem is simpler, you don't need to learn the networks when you have essentially an ergodic stationary field. And I do believe that one should be able progressively to capture most classical physical uh, phenomena as long as we deal with ergodic stationary fields. So turbulence are typical uh, uh, example or the kind of fields you have in, uh, in cosmology. But of course, there are beautiful problems to try to understand how these Hamiltonian expression relates to the underlying uh, microscopic uh, models of the physics. And the last thing is, when you begin to reach the intermediate scale, this is, let's say, uh, the domain of material science in physics, then the problem gets much more complicated. And uh, I have a tendency to believe that there, you need to learn basically uh, the interaction potential. They are getting too complicated, or maybe some people will have a way to avoid learning. But let's say at that stage, uh, we have no way to uh, avoid uh, learning. And that may be where uh, learning is really important. At the same time, interpretation uh, should take its place. And there's very interesting problems to try to understand what's the nature of these potentials that have been so that's it. Thanks very much. Right. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. Um, does anyone in the audience have any questions? Okay. Well, well, maybe they think about it. I do have one actually, and it's, I'm very impressed by your conclusion how you managed to talk so easily just by this slight tweak, find back the state of the art. And I was wondering, um, does the, does that indirectly imply that um, the deep neural network, the rest net in this case, uh, which is which is learning its filters, is learning something that is equivalent to these um, wavelet phases? Uh, if you have a look at the filters they have, are they in any way comparable? Okay. Uh, so to answer that, let me uh, show that slide. There is when you look at these neural nets, whether it's ResNet and all the different architecture, what is easily accessible is the first layer. And if you look at the first layer, they look like wavelengths. But then all the other layers, there are three-dimensional filters, which is a product of the 2D filters and of the potential. So it's then very difficult to separate where, what is the spatial filters and what is the potential? So first layer, we see the wavelet. The other layers, very hard, because you only see these 3D filters, which are basically the 2D filters multiplied by the 1D potential. So you could factorize wavelets out of that. Does that really reveal what they are doing? Uh, we do believe that it does, but that's to be demonstrated. Okay, so I, uh, and also I would say that uh, the neural nets have a huge amount of parameters. So they have a lot of flexibility. Whether they do that of some other combinations of these uh, vectors, I don't know. There's no reason why they should be a unique solution. What we are proposing here is a way to structure the problem and to propose let's say a simple solution or a so solution, but you can always do a recombination and, and get other filters probably. Yeah, but very interesting, very, very impressive. Um, I don't know if you have a question, Johan. I see you have uh, unmuted and uh, activated. Yeah, uh, I have a small question. Uh, uh, 
Hi, uh, hi, um, I have read your book, The um, Wave Need Transform, uh, carefully. <laughs> and uh, um, I have one question that uh, we know we have uh, different uh, wave need filters, like the Gable filters or the Doppler filters. And uh, all of them are um, formulated by our humans, by mathematicians. They have a solid mathematical background. So uh, in the deep learning um, error, I'm thinking if we can use the deep neural network or to machine learning methods to help us to design uh, some new wave needs, um filters. Okay, so uh, in some sense, they are learning. When you look at these filters, you observe uh, as I said in the first layer, something that looks like wavelets and they are not the standard orthogonal wavelets or, or the Gabor wavelet. But I would say that it doesn't matter so much what wavelet you are using. The wavelet is here essentially to separate the different frequencies and the different orientations. So whether you use this wavelet or this wavelet doesn't make a huge difference. What makes a huge difference is the building of the potential that is going to build the scale interaction. So if you look back at the time of the research on wavelets in the 90s, there have been a lot of work on trying to optimize this wavelet basis versus this wavelet basis. And most of this work ended up being forgotten and few wavelet bases remained because in particular the Dobishi wavelets or the Gabor wavelet, because they had nice properties and also because it didn't matter so much how you were optimizing the wavelets on the final result. So I would rather say here that essentially you don't care so much what is the precise wavelet you take as long as you do the scale separation and the orientation separation that you expect should be done to reveal the physical phenomena. Okay, okay. thank you. No, thank you, very interesting. Uh, does anyone else have another question? Right, well, I don't think so. So, right, thank you again very much for this uh, super interesting talk and very impressive <laughs> results indeed. And, uh, yeah, thank you. See you another time then. Thank you. Goodbye.